Grace and peace be with you. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm the pastor of Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. I'm really glad that you are with us today for our online worship service. As we start a new series today called Missing Peace, we're going to be talking throughout this series about all the different areas of our lives where we are lacking peace. And as we think about that and start our worship service, I have a chat question for you. And the, the chat question is this, what's one area in our world where peace just doesn't seem possible to you? You know, what's one area where peace doesn't seem possible? And man, there's so many different ways that you could, you could take this question. Um, I think particularly right now, where I look at the war that we have between Israel and Palestine, um, it's just an area in the world where the, the, there's so much history, uh, there's so much uh, religion involved, it, it just doesn't seem like peace is possible. Uh, I'm confident you can think of other areas, other places where there just seems to be constant strife and difficulty. What is, what is it for you? What's, what's an area of our world where peace just doesn't even seem possible? Uh, we're going to begin our worship service today in singing. I invite you to join Kevin in this song. Advent today, this season of preparing to celebrate Jesus' birth, we remember that in the days of exile and uncertainty for the people of Israel, the prophet Isaiah cried out, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. In the midst of our own encounters today with uncertainty and upheaval and our, our longing for deliverance, Jesus calls to us, Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. Today we wait. We wait as a people surprised again and again by God who shakes us out of our complacency 
and wakes us up to the work of God's kingdom all around us. As I light the first Advent candle today here in Potterville, I invite you to light a candle at home. Now, if you have an Advent wreath with candles, that's great, but most of us don't have that. So light whatever candle or light you do have at home. We light this candle today as a sign of our shocking hope. May we stay awake to God's activity in the world as we wait in expectation that even now, even now God is with us, working to restore us to the fullness of life with God and one another. Amen. Light your candle at home as I light my candle here in Potterville. May the light of that candle today remind us of God's presence with us as we worship. Will you pray with me? God, today, as we look to you for peace, we wrestle with this question together, is peace even possible? There is so much wrong, God, in our world. There's so much hurt and pain in our own lives. Today, we seek you, we seek your presence, and we seek peace that can only come from you. God, God I pray that you would give us your peace. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I invite you to continue praying with me together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Let's join in that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we are beginning our new series called Missing Peace. I'm going to be giving the message. I'm really excited about this entitled, Is Peace Even Possible? But first, here is our host for today. Hi, my name is Lillian Robertson and I'm your host today. Welcome to Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. We're glad you joined us for worship. I invite you to get connected to Sycamore Creek Church to take next steps to help you along on your faith journey and to submit prayer requests. You do all those things by filling out a digital connection card at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connection. Take a moment to do that. We'll refer to that connection card again later in the worship service. Connect with us for the first time and we'll send you a free book. We hope today's worship will be impactful and meaningful. If today's worship is helpful for you, take a moment to share it with your friends on social media. You can share the worship service and use our hashtag, hashtag SCC Potterville. Today's message begins with this. we celebrate a birthday, it's pretty common to put some candles on a birthday cake or a cupcake or something. I'm thinking about birthdays because we're heading toward our celebration of a really important birthday on December 25th. It's Jesus' birthday. As a reminder to us all, the celebration of Christmas is not your birthday celebration or mine or about the presents you might give or receive. It's really about Jesus and it's about celebrating his birth. If it's your birthday and the candles have been lit, well, what do you do next? You blow the candles out, right? That's my grandpa blowing out his birthday candles on his 99th birthday that we celebrated at the beginning of November. That we celebrated his birthday with him. And, you know, before you blow out the candles, have you ever had the birthday person make a wish? And the idea, right, is that if you, if you blow out all the candles and you don't tell anyone your wish, then the wish will come true. Well, Clearly that's a superstitious idea and blowing out all the candles has nothing to do with whatever you might wish for. But that did get me thinking about a question. If you had one wish, what would you wish for? If you could wish for anything and you'd have that wish come true, what would you wish for? Let's ask each other that question. We're going to pause a moment here and I'm going to invite you to turn to one another or, or put your answer in the chat 
If you have one wish, what would you wish for? There are a lot of directions that you can go with that question about one wish. You, know, you could wish for more money because, well, you could do a lot of good, right? With a lot of money. You can make a big difference in people's lives if you have more money. Or, you know, you could wish for a relationship. Maybe you don't have a life partner right now and wishing for someone to live life together with sounds really good. Or, you know, you could wish for beauty. I couldn't quite figure out how to even illustrate that one with a picture. Uh, but you could also wish for happiness, or you could wish for good health, or you could wish to have fame, or you could try to game the question and, well, you could wish for more wishes. And that's not an acceptable answer. <laughs> I want to show you something from the New Testament as we head into Christmas and we head toward this Christmas season. In Luke's account of Jesus' life, Jesus is born in lowly circumstances. But his birth is declared by angels. And when the angels came to announce the birth of Christ, do you know what the angels said? Well, they said, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. You can summarize that verse this way. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Will you say that last underlined phrase with me? Peace on earth. When Jesus would talk to people and greet them, he would say, peace be with you. And when something would happen, even something traumatic, Jesus would say, go in peace. The early missionary for Jesus, the Apostle Paul, he would write letters to his churches and he'd often start his letters saying, grace and, and what? And peace be with you. There are so many options for how Paul could start a letter to a church and yet he chose grace and peace peace. There's a reason for that. And maybe it's because what so many people really want, what we really wish for, and maybe we're not even aware we want it or need it, is peace. We want peace. Real peace. A, a divine peace that only God can give. You see, we, we can have money in the bank, but no peace in our hearts. We can be successful on the outside, and empty on the inside. Oh, we can get good grades in school and be absolutely devoid of peace. We can be married but not have peace in our home. What we want and, and what we may not even know we want it is peace, a peace that comes from God. And what so many of us have right now, it, it, it's not peace, it's the opposite. We, you know, we have tension, we're afraid, we're anxious, we have misunderstandings, we have disagreements, we have hurt feelings, we have bitterness, we have unforgiveness. We're missing peace. That's the title of the series we're starting today. Because we're missing peace in our lives. What we really want is peace, a peace that comes from God. 
Now, the title of my message today is a provocative question. The question is, is peace even possible? And that's a great question as we get ready for 2024. We want peace, but is it even possible? Uh, because we also want peace in our circumstances. Is, is, is peace even possible amidst whatever it is? Pick your problem. Is peace possible with political divisions and an election looming? You do remember that's coming up this year in 2024, don't you? Is peace possible with all the wars we have around the globe? Is peace possible with immigration issues and challenges? Is peace possible with ongoing systemic and structural racism baked into our country? Is peace possible with rising prices, a growing gap between rich and poor and financial insecurity? We're missing peace in our circumstances and we ask, is peace even possible? Yes, peace is possible. And today we will look to God to find peace. Let's start doing that in prayer. God, thank you for all who have gathered today for worship. In a complicated world and in a complicated season, we gather amid pain and loss and tension and hurt and fear. Today we give our cares to you. And we ask that you would pour out your peace on us. Give us a peace that goes beyond our circumstances and our understanding. May your word and your spirit bring comfort today. In the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. I have some powerful words of God from the Bible for us today. I'm going to start with some verses from the Old Testament from the book of Isaiah. Now let me give you a little context for Isaiah. In a season much like today of fear and anxiety and unsettledness, the prophet Isaiah prophesied of a day with unbridled worship filled with peace and passion and praise for the goodness of God. The people of God were missing peace. And Isaiah saw something better. Here's his prophecy. In that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. Our city is strong. We are surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Open the gates to all who are righteous. Allow the faithful to enter. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. I love this promise of God from Isaiah. I want this promise. I need this promise. You will be kept in perfect peace, the peace that comes from heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm way more familiar in my life with imperfect peace, or at least inconsistent peace. I can have peace one moment and, and maybe pray a prayer to God and, and hand my burdens off to God and oh, I have peace for about three minutes. <laughs> and then it all comes rushing back. I can have peace and tranquility and assurance and mere moments later, I'm having waves of anxiety and dread and fear and insecurity. I'm most familiar with imperfect peace or inconsistent peace and yet God promises in Isaiah perfect peace. Well, that leads to another great question of, well, what is perfect peace? Before I give you what I think, let's pause a moment here to reflect together on peace. Turn to someone who's with you and, or type in the chat an answer to this question. What is perfect peace? And how would you define it? Let's discuss that.
word peace in the Old Testament comes from a really rich Hebrew word, the word shalom. It's a Jewish greeting for coming and going. Someone might say to you, shalom. Now this word means way more than just peace. It means wholeness, it means completeness, it means fullness of peace. This is complete and perfect peace. It's peace with God where there's no dread or fear about where you stand with God. You know things are good. That's peace with God. It's also, it's peace with other people. And never worry about whether we're good with each other or not. It's peace with yourself. Whew. That's a big one. I'm okay. I'm even good. It's peace with your circumstances. It's peace even when your circumstances aren't what you would ever want them to be. This is shalom. It's complete, whole, perfect peace. And it comes from God. The original text in Isaiah says you will be kept in shalom, shalom. I don't know, you probably didn't know that. I didn't either. The word shalom appears twice. How cool is that? I learned that in preparing this message for today. This is an emphatic statement in the Hebrew language. You get a double portion of peace. This is complete, whole, perfect peace. It's shalom, shalom, and it comes from God. Now, let me be clear. This perfect peace doesn't mean that you won't have any trouble. You will still have trouble. Jesus himself said in John 16 that in this world you will have trouble. And this peace doesn't mean that you won't have problems. You will have problems. It doesn't mean that nothing will ever break on you. It doesn't mean that your kids will be perfectly behaved even when you're on your way to a worship service. It doesn't mean your spouse won't get on your nerves like I can sometimes get on Jana's nerves. Sorry about that, Jana. A perfect peace doesn't mean you won't have real struggles and difficulties in life. And it also doesn't mean ignoring or denying our struggles and difficulties in life. Perfect peace isn't, isn't ignoring everything around you. I hope that's some helpful clarification right there about what perfect peace is. But, but the question remains, so what is shalom, shalom? What is this perfect peace? And the perfect peace of God is simply this. Peace is God's presence. Perfect peace is God's presence with us. It's God's perspective. It's God's assurance. Even, even when life is anything but what you would want it to be, God is right there with us. And if you're like me, this is where we push back a bit, right? At least I push back here because for many of us, Life is not always or, or even often how we'd have it be. It, you know, maybe your body is betraying you and you're frustrated and angry about your health. Or maybe someone at your school is being cruel to you. Or maybe it's the health of a loved one. Or maybe one of your friends is just being a total jerk. Or maybe your marriage sucks right now. Or maybe one of your children is really struggling with something like an addiction. Where's the peace in that? How do we experience the peace of God, the shalom, shalom right now with whatever it is that we're going through? You see, each of us has this struggle for peace and it begins in our minds. Now, I don't know about you, but I need to hear this today because there's quite often an epic struggle for peace that's going on in my head. I can know that God is with me. I can know the truth of God. But then my mind wanders into all sorts of untruths. I can wholeheartedly believe God's truth and believe the promises of God for me. And a moment later, I'm doubting God's presence, God's power in my life. There's a struggle. There's a struggle in my mind between what God says and what my mind tends to wrongly believe. See, the struggle for peace is real and it begins in our minds. So let's look at two different versions of this powerful truth from Isaiah. Again, Isaiah wrote, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Perfect peace, shalom, shalom, when we're fixed on the truth of God. We're not denying reality, but it's not our focus. We have peace when we're focused on God. Another translation says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Now, notice what Isaiah doesn't say. Isaiah doesn't say you'll have perfect peace 
when your mind is fixed on CNN or Fox News or NPR or TikTok or X or Facebook or Instagram, I, I may have left out your own personal obsession there, but I hope you get the idea. Isaiah doesn't say that you're going to have perfect peace when your mind is fixed on the future. Isaiah doesn't say that you're going to have perfect peace whenever your mind is fixed on your financial problems. Think about those more. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say you're going to have perfect peace when your mind is focused on the bad news you just got from your doctor. No, no. Isaiah tells us we'll have perfect peace when our mind is fixed and focused on the truth of God. Now, the Hebrew word that's translated as fixed is the word somak. Somak. Somak means to lean on completely. It means to fully rest oneself. Imagine this wall that this wall was God, only God is much bigger and stronger. This is what we do with all of our mind. We lean on God. We lean into God. We could literally translate this verse from Isaiah. You will have perfect peace when you lean completely on God's promises. Perfect peace is when your thoughts are resting on God's unfailing promises. Now, all this leads to another really provocative question. What's your mind fixed on? Like, for real, what's your mind fixed on? Where does your mind often drift to? Whenever you have idle time, where does your mind go? What do you focus on? What consumes your mind? Is it your kids or your grandkids or your worries about their future? Or Maybe it's your own future that consumes you. Uh, thinking about what's next, your to-do list, whatever it might be. Is it, is it financial worries? Is it political divisions in the direction of our country? Is it the wars in the Ukraine and in Israel and Palestine? Maybe your mind is consumed with what's going wrong in the world right now or what could go wrong in the world right now. What is your mind fixed on? You'll only have perfect peace when your mind is fixed on God. In the New Testament of the Bible, there's this guy named Paul. I've, I've mentioned Paul already. And he was an early missionary for Jesus, telling people all around the Mediterranean about Jesus. And he would start churches. And to one of those churches in Philippi, he wrote this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Fix your thoughts on God. Lean into God with your thoughts by focusing on whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, and excellent. Fix your mind on God. Focus on God. And when you do that, what happens? Well, Paul continues, he says, As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. The God of peace. Now, I want to make sure we're getting this because, as I said, I need to know this myself. Now, when is the God of peace with me? It's when my mind is fixed on God. When is God's peace with me? Will you say that with me? When my mind is fixed on God. God is good all the time. God's promises are true all the time. God never fails. When I'm lost, God is my guide. When I'm weak, God is my strength. When I'm hurting, God is my comforter. I will fix my mind on God. And the God of peace is with me. Whatever my circumstances. In another letter to another church, Paul writes, Can anything, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? We could modernize what Paul wrote and we could add relational tension or loneliness or anxiety or loss or depression or fear or discrimination. And, but what's Paul's answer? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. No, no, nothing can separate us from God's love. Whatever our circumstances, whatever struggle for shalom, shalom we have in our minds, we can have peace through the God who is victorious. 
That's a promise of God. Paul concludes, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's love for us is revealed this Christmas through Jesus. My mind is fixed on Jesus, and when my mind is fixed on Jesus, God offers me shalom, shalom. It's the perfect peace of God. It's the presence of God. Jesus said in John's account of Jesus' life, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. The peace I give. Jesus gives us a gift, peace. Now notice something about the peace Jesus gives. It's a gift the world cannot give because it's God's peace. Jesus is not giving you a peace. He's giving you God's peace. And God's peace is not found in the absence of problems. God's peace is found in the presence of God. There's a powerful story about peace in Mark's account of Jesus' life. Jesus and his disciples, they're out on a boat on the Sea of Galilee and a big storm blew up. And, and the storm was so massive, the disciples were afraid for their lives. And you're thinking, what's going to happen? We're, we're going to die out here at sea. And the disciples did exactly what I would do. They started freaking out. Peace? There's no peace for them in the midst of the storm. And, and well, what was Jesus doing? He was taking a nap. Jesus is taking a nap. Now, there were really two storms on that day. One storm had thunder and lightning and wind and waves. You, you could sense and feel it. It was powerful. But there was a second storm. A storm not on the outside, but a storm on the inside. And I don't know how it is for you, but at least for me, so many times the storm on my inside is way, way harder to manage than the storm on the outside. I can look fine to you. But the storm on the inside can consume me with fear and anxiety and doubt and worry. And amid the storm on the outside, the disciples cried out, Jesus, don't you even care? We're going to die. Now, some of you right now, it's the storm on the inside, just like those disciples. That storm is bringing about doubts. It's ramping up fear. You're wondering, God, are you there? Do you notice? I've prayed. I've cried out. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm looking, but I don't see you. It's like you're just taking a nap. Now in this story, Jesus wakes up calmly. Maybe he stretches. And in the middle of the storm, with the power of God, he declares peace. Be still. Now you can't speak what you don't have. Jesus, who is peace, gives his peace. And we can be kept in perfect peace when our mind is fixed on Jesus. Now, can I be totally honest with you today? I'm a work in progress in what I'm preaching about. This is tough stuff. I know this truth and I believe this truth, but I don't always experience God's perfect peace. I'm learning and I'm growing in this. Our church has been through all sorts of new things over this past year, and I've been through all sorts of new things over this past year. I've constantly been learning and realizing things I don't know yet as an executive pastor. It's hard for me to have peace when I'm facing something totally new to me. This past year has been super busy. Uh, balancing campus pastoring and executive pastoring and youth pastoring has been a lot to navigate. And when, when it feels like there's more to do than you have time to do it, it's been hard to be peaceful. At home, my son Drew is in his senior year of high school and he's figuring out his next steps in life. And I desperately want Drew to be happy and successful. And as I sift through my hopes and dreams for his future, it's hard to be peaceful. You know, over the past year, the arthritis in my knees has flared up, and I've been trying to figure out with my doctor how to get it under control. As I worry about my pain level and how best to navigate health issues, it's hard to feel peaceful. And there is so much more, but, but that's just a few of the things that are in my life on the outside and on the inside. 
At times, the wind and waves can feel like they are all around me. So I'm working to fix my eyes on Jesus. Now, fixing my eyes on Jesus is a daily moment-by-moment -moment practice. I, I start my day not with my phone, not with the news, but with reading my Bible and journaling. I'm, I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus. Well, and then the day starts coming at me, and often I can get overwhelmed and, and discouraged or afraid. And then in those moments, I'm training myself to fix my eyes on Jesus. I pray to God. I sing songs of praise when I'm driving in my car. I take the time during my day to be thankful and to notice the places or the ways that God is working. There's a struggle in my mind, and I'm going to use habits and practices of scripture, of prayer, of singing, of, of time with other Christians, of serving others that help me to fix my eyes on Jesus. Which brings us to our final chat question. This is an important one. How about you? What helps you to fix your eyes on Jesus? What helps you to lean in to Jesus? Let's discuss that. If you are sitting here today and you're struggling in your mind with a fear, with a loss, with a hurt, with a pain, with a worry, I pray for us all that we would find these final words from Paul comforting. Do not be anxious about anything. Whatever it is that's weighing you down, whatever it's that's, it is that's gripping your heart, don't be anxious about that. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, but in every situation, when there are babies being born, and when a person's life is ending, when the doctor's news is good or, or when the doctor's news is bad, when the bank account's high or, or when the bank account's low, when the grade is good or, or when the grade is poor, when your marriage is on a high or, or when your marriage is falling apart, but in every situation. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This is leaning on God. This is fixing our eyes on Jesus. And then what? And the peace of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the peace of God. Do you hear that? It's, it's the peace of God. It's not the peace of this world. It's not the peace of having enough money in the bank. It's, it's not the peace of when everything's going the way that you wanted it and envisioned it. It's the peace of God. In other words, circumstances can't give it and circumstances can't take it away because this is a peace that is not from this world. This is a peace that only comes from God. Peace, it's not the absence of heartache. It's not the absence of loss. It's not being void of disappointment. Real peace is the presence of God. And it's possible in 2024. So whatever you're going through right now, fix your thoughts on God. Think about what's good. Think about what's pure. And your mind will be kept in shalom, shalom. Perfect peace. 
May this be a final blessing for you and for all of us. Peace be with you. Grace and peace be with you. Go in peace. May God's peace that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds and your souls. Peace be with you. Amen. I have a few announcements for us. And the first announcement is that we would love to help you get connected with Sycamore Creek Church. We'd love to connect with you. You can do that. You can also take next steps that help you grow in your faith by filling out a digital connection card. I want to encourage you to take a moment, pause right now, go to sycamorecreekchurch.org connection and fill out a digital connection card. We have all sorts of wonderful things that are coming up that help us to celebrate Christmas. You'll see the Christmas schedule listed there on the screen. It, it kicks off on December 17th with our kids program that morning in worship. We have in the evening, we have caroling around Potterville. Um, on the 23rd, we have uh, our Sanctuary Spirits Christmas service. In the morning of the 24th, we have a, our final Sunday in Advent Christmas service and then Christmas Eve night, December 24th, we have our candlelight Christmas Eve service. There's so many different opportunities there. Now, I want to encourage you to come in person and attend one of those worship opportunities. We'll also be, of course, releasing things online for those services as well. But, but come in person, and when you do that, invite a friend. Think of who, who you know who is missing peace this Christmas season and needs to encounter the peace that comes from Jesus at Christmas. Speaking of Christmas, we are continuing with our Christmas offering challenge. That offering challenge is to give away as much as you spend on Christmas. And in particular, we want to make that easy for you by encouraging you to give to our Christmas offering. Our Christmas offering you can give to throughout the whole month of December. You can give online. You can uh, mail in a check to the church if you would like. 100% uh, of our offerings received on our, our Christmas Eve candlelight service, all that goes in our Sanctuary Spirit service, all that goes to the Christmas offering. Now, as a reminder, our Christmas offering goes for three things. It goes for care ministries and caring for people in our church and our community. It goes for local mission, where we reach out to our community to share the love of Jesus. And it goes for our global missions, where we share God's love around the globe through the United Methodist Church and through Dr. Mir and her feeding program in Nicaragua. We do so much good with that Christmas offering, and I want to thank you for your generous giving to Sycamore Creek and your generous giving to that Christmas offering challenge. You'll see on the screen there, you can go to sycamorecreekchurch.org slash give if you'd like to give to support the mission of Sycamore Creek. You can also go there to give to support the Christmas offering and all the good that we do through that Christmas offering. Speaking of the Christmas offering, I have a video I want to share with you with Dottie Wilinski. Dottie attends the South Lansing campus and a fun fact about her is that she and I used to be the small group leaders for Sycamore Creek together uh, way before I became a pastor. Uh, here's Dottie talking about the Christmas offering. So my name is Dottie Walensky. I have been coming to Sycamore Creek since uh, I think 2005 or six. It's been a long time. Um, my kids were still at home. Now they're adults. They're in their own. They're, you know, have their own kids. I have grandchildren. So um, I've been working with Sycamore Creek all that time and served in a variety of areas, but I always love giving. So when I first heard about the challenge of giving away as much at Christmas as I spent on Christmas, I was a little intimidated because I had a teenage kids and we didn't have a lot of money and I was like, ah, but I really, I am a generous person. Like one of my spiritual gifts is giving. I like to give. So I tried to figure out a way that I could do that. And um, I gave some away that year. I don't remember how much at all. Um, but I did make a commitment to give $10 a week throughout the year so that I could always give at least $520 every year. And more if I could, but that's what I thought. I decided to join the challenge because I really recognize, it really resonated with me that it's Jesus' birthday, not our birthday. And we do give each other gifts and I like doing that. That's part of a fun family time for me. But I want to help the world. Like that's one of my goals as a Christian is to give to others and to help them and people who need really practical help, not just, I'll pray for you. You know, that's good. We need to pray for each other. But um, some people need help paying their uh, utility bill or you know fix their car or whatever so why well, i would encourage other people to take the challenge is because it comes into the intangibles i can't say to you because i give away every you know 
at Christmas, la la, this happens or that happens, but I feel more engaged in my community and more like a part of a solution because there's so many needs all over the world. I can't do everything, but I can do this thing. I can do it well. I can give more and I can work from a little bit all the way up, you know, and anytime I get an extra bit of money, I can do that. And it just helps me feel engaged in my community. Thank you, Dottie, for talking about the Christmas offering. Thank you for your giving that allows us to do so many great things throughout the year. Here's Kevin with our final worship song. Thank you for joining us today for worship. I hope that you experience peace through our worship today and recognize that peace is possible. If today was intriguing to you, I hope that you will return again next week as we continue to explore missing peace. Hope to see you again soon.